deserves a round of applause, absolutely. Thank you very much. So, the Lord's message rang out is our title. It's a phrase from within 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. The Lord's message rang out. And we're going to see what we can learn from uh, not only today's passage, but from the series. We're going to be learning about the Apostle Paul, uh, in the, the author of this wonderful letter. We're going to be learning about the Thessalonians as a congregation, as a church. What were they going through? What can we learn from our first century brothers and sisters? And of course, more importantly than anything else, we're going to be learning about God. What does this letter teach us about God? Those are our areas of focus, if you like. Now, a bit of context on the Watford word again. I have put some background to the book of Thessalonians and what was going on. But just briefly for the moment, this is a young church. The church in Thessalonica, in Macedonia now, uh, is, uh, was started by Paul. Uh, it's in Acts 16 and 17. You'll find that record. He was there for a grand total of how long? Do we know? How long was he in Thessalonica? He started the church there. And he left after three weeks. Now imagine that. You don't know anything about Christianity. Not a thing. This chap, Paul's, called Paul, comes into town with two other friends. Paul, uh, Silas and Timothy. Maybe some others, but definitely the three of them. They start preaching in the synagogues and then out, outdoors. And a lot of people start to believe. Gentiles and Greeks. So it appeals the message to all kinds of people. Including not only not a, a number of not a few prominent Greek women, so significant people in the community. And they gather and they become Christians. And after three weeks, the Apostle Paul, not just Paul, not just a preacher, but the Apostle Paul, he has to flee. He has to leave town. In fact, the, the people in the church say, I think effectively you need to go because there's so much persecution because of what's happening. That he got, and now you're a three-week-old church. How do you think we would have done? Let's say we were all three-week-old Christians. Just become three weeks, all of us, all of us, not, not most of us. Every single one of us was no more than three weeks old as a Christian. Some of us less, because I guess some became Christians nearer to the time when Paul left, right? So the maximum age of a Christian in this congregation, three weeks. You don't, know, you don't have a New Testament, right? You don't have any writings of Jesus or the apostles yet, because Thessalonians is one of the, maybe the second earliest of Paul's letters, maybe Galatians first, then First Thessalonians. So there's no, nothing written down. You've got... Maybe an Old Testament, but you'd have had to rely on Jewish members of the congregation for that and their interpretation of it. The Gentiles wouldn't know the Old Testament. So you've got a few Jewish members who know some, probably some Old Testament. And, you, and that's it. How would we have done? I wonder, you know, what kind, of, what kind of challenges would we have faced? And not only would we be baby Christians with no New Testament, we'd have no one who'd witnessed Jesus. And we'd be under severe persecution. So you're imprisoned. Friends, some of us will be imprisoned. Some of us banned from work. Lost our jobs. No livelihood. Ostracized by family. How would we have done? I sometimes wonder, you know, we think sometimes we're quite strong and, you know, we're okay. And, but a three-week old church in those circumstances... Would, my question is this. Th this letter is written about a year later. And you've already seen some of the very positive things that Paul says about them. And we're going to see more of that in chapters 2 and 3. My question is, if that had been us, would we even have been around a year later? Honestly? Would our faith stand up to that? Or might we have been around but gone off on some weird tangent because we didn't know much and got about some of our teaching wrong and or not lived up to what it meant to be a Christian, perhaps bring Christianity into disrepute because we didn't live the right way or believe the right things. <coughs> and I say that not to say that we wouldn't have managed that. It's not, not saying that we're, not, we're worse or something than these people, but more to say... Isn't it amazing that they did stay faithful? And isn't it amazing that they not only stayed faithful, but they became, it says here, a model to all the believers in that whole region. This is a region hundreds of miles north and south, east and west. <clears throat> this is not just in your local town. They became a model church for Greece and Macedonia 
and even beyond those borders, within one year, as baby Christians. So I share that to say, I'd like to encourage us to study and think about what I'm saying today, but also to read 1 Thessalonians for ourselves with the approach, with the attitude of, I'm, I'm going to study this to be inspired by people who had a faith that I, I should admire. What is it that kept them going? What is it that made them such a model church? And perhaps we personally, but congregationally, I'm hoping, we can learn something from that. That will help us to be the church that could be a model to other churches. Not, not that we're, that's our aim exactly. You understand? I'm not saying, you know, look at us. But more that we could be held up as a model by somebody else because God had worked in, in us similarly to how he worked <coughs> amongst the Thessalonians. So that's my hope and prayer for this series and, uh, and for what we'll look at here today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the chapter, uh, making a couple of points today, and pointing a couple of things out, and then I draw a, a summary into two main uh, topics about God and about service. So that's where we're going with what we're doing today. Can we go to the next slide, please, Barry? Just one other thing. Um, I'm doing a daily devotional podcast based on First Thessalonians for the months of January and February. You can find it on my podcast feed. That's the website. Uh, you can find it on Apple uh, iTunes or, or Podbean or, or most of the normal podcast providers. It will also go onto the Watford podcast feed. So if you have that, that's fine. These are five, six minute long, short devotional takes, usually on one verse at a time as we go through First, and sec- uh, First Thessalonians in January and February. So if you want to listen to those, uh, they'll be the first ones online now for today, New, New Year's Day, and, uh, and then they'll go up daily. Um, they're scheduled to go up at two in the morning. Uh, so that, uh, so that you know, you'll get them when you wake up if you want them then. So that's something else that's a resource. So next slide. Let's walk through chapter one and note a few things. So Paul, Ty- Silas and Timothy, teamwork here. Teamwork's very important. That to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. I love that grace and peace point. Grace comes first, then comes peace. We need the grace of God to enjoy the shalom of God, the peace, uh, the wholeness of him. Verse 2, we thank God when, he says, always. We always thank God for all of you. I like the word all there, because it could be that the people listening, some were closer to Paul than others. And of course, some were converted while he was there, and others after he left. But he says, I'm not making any distinction between any of you. Those I personally helped become Christians, or Paul and and, uh, Silas and Timothy, uh, or those who become Christians since who I don't really know personally, all of you. I thank God for all of you. He has a heart for every single person, continually mentioning you in our prayers. What's Paul's disposition to this church? A church which is a model, but clearly is not without its problems, because that's why he's writing the letter. He is thankful for the community of faithful, the faithful people. That's really important that we feel that way here. That we're always thankful to be part of this. Not that it's always easy. Not that the relationships are always like we'd like them to be. Not that we are perfect and that we don't have our problems. But being part of this should always make us thankful. And I think prayer is part of that. As we pray for one another, that helps us to be thankful for one another. But that's what he's doing. We remember before our God and Father... Your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Included in his prayers are his prayers, are his remembrances of how hard they worked. And I think this is quite interesting. He brings this up at the beginning of the letter. You are hard workers for God. I'm not sure how distinct these three words are specifically, uh, work, labour and endurance. They are slightly different, but I'm not sure that that's very that important, as more the point is they work and they work and they work for God. They toil to build the church and they're motivated by faith, love and hope. (coughs) Faith, love and hope. That comes up elsewhere in the Bible, doesn't it? 1 Corinthians 13 and a number of other passages. Now, those three qualities of what it means to be inspired by God. 
to be inspired to, by, to faith, to love, and to hope. And that means that the work gets uh, done. The, uh, the endurance here is a word used of a, um, not someone who's gutting it out, like enduring as in a, I'm going to gut it out. It's, it's the word used of a stout-hearted soldier. It's like, I'm going to do my duty, and I'm going to do it well, and no one's going to stand in my way. It's that kind of endurance. Anyway, that's what's going on there. Verse 4. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. You see how warm Paul is here. How, how well he thinks of them. You are loved by God. He wants to give them encouragement. Whatever you're going through, you are loved by God. You have been chosen by God. It wasn't an accident when I came, Paul says, and Silas and Timothy. You were chosen. You are loved and chosen. And he calls them brothers, brothers and sisters. And brothers, brothers and sisters, of course in the Greek it's brothers, and they've adjusted it in the NIV to be more inclusive, brothers and sisters, because even though he writes brothers, he means brothers and sisters. Uh, this phrase is used in, uh, in First uh, Thessalonians a number of times, 28 times. He refers to brother or sister or brothers or sisters. 28 times in a short little letter. It, it shows how much he values the family nature of the congregation. Perhaps it would be good for us to think about how can we be more, more family this year? Genuinely family. I'm looking at us here and, and those of you online. Hello online. Nice to have you with us. I know some have not been well, like Patricia Palmer's not well, so Simon and Patricia are home. Uh, whether at, at home or here, how could we be more family? A question for us to think about for ourselves. What's our part in that? And verse 5, our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction. Deep conviction. And you know how we lived among you for your sake. God changed them dramatically. He changed them dramatically. He's changed us dramatically. And you know us. Uh, uh, he says, you know me, you know us. We know, you know how we lived among you. They had depth in their relationships. So there's a the relationship theme going on here as well. Verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. The joy given by the Holy Spirit. So they imitated the right things. They imitated Jesus. They imitated Paul, but in as much as he was able to show them what it meant to live like Jesus, to walk like him, they did that. They accepted suffering as part of the package, and that's the way it is. And they got joy from the Holy Spirit. Um, as somebody mentioned earlier, we're moving into a year that doesn't look like, on the face of it, like it's going to be much more fun than last year. It doesn't look like it, does it? I mean, it's not like inflation suddenly got under control or everybody's getting the pay rises they want or Brexit sorted out or the war in Ukraine has ended or I don't know, you, got, you have your own list. We're not going into a year that's obviously going to be any better in its circumstances than previous years. But we do have the promise of and the ability to connect with the Holy Spirit and he is the one that gives us joy. And may I charge myself and all of us with being people characterised, no matter what the, is going on out there, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Whatever's happening with health and life, we can have the joy of the Holy Spirit. And if anything marks us out from the rest of the world, it isn't always our behaviour exactly, but at least it should be our joy. A joy rooted in God, not in circumstances. There's a slide, actually. Uh, Martin Luther said this. If Christ wore a crown of thorns, why should his followers expect only a crown of roses? It's the thorns that characterise Christ, not rose petals. Yeah, it's nice to have some rose petals. Nothing against rose petals. But, but that's true, isn't it? And they experience that more severely than, than generally we do, I think. Verse 7. You became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. I mentioned that earlier. They modeled Christianity to other Christians. What a good thing that would be if we can do that. If God can help us to do that. Verse 8. The Lord's message rang out from you, 
not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has been become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. And their reputation as a good church, if you like, is based on God's work amongst them. It's not about their gifts or about their talents. It's about God's work amongst them. And it rang out. The message rang out from them, becoming known everywhere. It's a bit like if you watch a good movie and you're with some friends talking about movies. You know, what, what movies have you watched that you liked? And we tell each other, right? And that gets passed on and people watch movies uh, other people have recommended. And I think it's just like that, really. Uh, I, I, it's, it's telling others because it's done something for us. We liked it. it. It's good, you know. And that's how the message rings out. It's not about techniques. It's just about enthusiasm. If we're enjoying our walk with God, we'd like other people to enjoy it too, right? That's really all it's about. Verse 9, they, tell them, they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You turned. That's a repentance word, isn't it? And you turned. You turned to serve God. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And verse 10, and to wait. I don't know about you, but I'm not a fan of waiting. I don't like the feeling of waiting. Hmm. Penny and I, were at, I drove up to Nottingham, uh, near Nottingham to Newark yesterday to visit her dad. We had a great time with her dad, her stepmom. Fred came with us, our son. We had a really good time. Uh, and, uh, but because the weather was so bad, my car, which is an electric car, normally would go there and back with one charge. But it needed to charge because it was bad weather. And we went to two different charging stations, both of which wouldn't work. And uh, we eventually got one working by phoning up and standing in the rain while phoning the, the company to reboot the charging unit. And eventually it did, and we got charged, and we got home, and it was fine. But I didn't like waiting. And uh, truthfully, it only took an extra five, ten minutes, right? But I didn't like waiting, especially in the rain. None of us like waiting, but they wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. They were content to wait for God's timing. That's a challenge, isn't it? You and I pray about things that we want done yesterday. Their trust in God is revealed by patient service. Next slide. What are your impressions of this church? Okay, let's stop for a moment. Give me an impression, just maybe one thing. What's one thing that stands out to you? from this church so far? What stands out for you? Growth. Growth? Okay, they've grown in numbers and they've grown in maturity. God has really grabbed their hearts or they have really seen something, had a real revelation of who God was. Yes. And they couldn't shake out of their system kind of thing. All right. <laughs> they've, they've, they've got God somehow. It's not just they've got a new religion. They've got God. Something God's in their heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. What else? What stands out? Your impressions of this church. I was I I always get the impression that that almost the pennies dropped and they've understood the meaning of life. Okay. Meaning of life. For us like, I think you have to, in order to to go and be persecuted, you really have to believe that actually this is what life is about. Right. This is what's true. It's a really good point. You know, we can endure all kinds of things if those things have meaning within them, mm -hmm. if there's a purpose and a meaning. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have. Barry? Um, as well as they got God, I think God's got them. Mm -hmm. um, he's actively using them intensively. Mm -hmm. Without that power, then they can come to your mind. It's his power. The power of God mentioned in, is it verse? Five, yeah, the power of the Holy Spirit, deep conviction. It's God's power in them. Yeah. 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 It's just like coming to meet again with family. We don't do this at all. Just now and again. And it's where the Holy Spirit comes more alive in us because his word is being preached and it comes back as encouragement. Mm. Some 
Well put. Thank you. Thank you. Impressions of this church. Anybody else? Okay, let me wrap up with a couple of thoughts. Uh, Next slide, please, Barry. God is the focus always. God is either as God, Father, Jesus, Son, Lord, Spirit, all the different words one might use for God or the Godhead. In chapter 1, in those 10 verses, God is referenced 15 times. 15 times in those 10 verses and mentioned 97 times in the total of 89 verses of the whole letter. So it's more than one a verse. We can sometimes forget that when Paul is writing a letter to a church like this, he's mostly talking about God. And I think that's so important for all of us as a congregation that the thing that we're most about is God. His agenda for us, not ours. Talking about him to him, <laughs> praying, list, listening to him by, in prayer, but also in his word itself. Uh, no one will ever be, in my opinion at least, no one will ever be all they could be as a Christian and strong as a Christian if we don't read God's word and let it sink in. We need God's word. We need that time with God. God is the one that gives us the grace and the peace that we need. He's the one that gives us the joy that helps us to endure suffering and helps us to wait patiently for his work. It is God who enables them to do all the work they have been doing and to inspire them to the point where they can inspire others. And the second thing on the next slide that I note here is that they had a genuine turning. A couple of you have sort of referred to that, that big change in them, that God is very real and powerful to them. They have turned from idols to serve, from idols to serve the living and true God. They turned, but clearly they didn't turn back again. Once they turned, they stayed turned. And I think one of the challenges of the Christian life is to stay turned towards God. And you and I, I don't know about you, but... Some, like some kind of magnet is sometimes over here. Feels like it's pulling me like some uh, compass needle back towards my old life. And sometimes it's, I'm with the wrong company or sometimes I'm watching the wrong stuff on television or listening to something. Or sometimes it's just, I don't know what it is, but I have this struggle, right? We all struggle with our past sins to some level or another. We all struggle with the tendencies of the world that are not Christ-like. And I just say this once today... Uh, given that we've been, some of us, away from each other for a while, sometimes when we're away from fellowship with fellow Christians, it weakens our convictions. And if you've been struggling with some things over Christmas and New Year that aren't Christ-like, it may be a good time to do some returning or strengthen your turning or talk about it with somebody to help you to deal with any sin that needs to be dealt with so that we can go into the rest of the year with a clear conscience and knowing that we're properly turned and staying turned because the only way we can really serve God is by turning you know that you can't have the foot in both camps right turning they turned to serve it was challenging for them to give up their idol worship and the next slide is a quote from a from N.T. Wright about this he said it would be like asking people in a modern city to give up using motor cars computers and telephones. I mean, turning from idol worship and from attending the, tit- the idol, the meals in the temples was so countercultural, so radical, they'd have looked so weird. And it would be like saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a Christian and therefore I will not have a car, I not have a computer, I won't have, I won't have a mobile phone. I, I, people would think you were weird and on some level they'd be right. Turning isn't just improving our lives. It's a radical shift. <clears throat> demonstrating loyalty to God. Turning away from the old ways of living, from what is comfortable or compromise, from fear and laziness, from sins, from half-heartedness, from guilt and shame, and turning to, turning to God, turning to hope, to love, to faith, to an exploration of the Spirit's desires for us, to listening to God, turning to, to some degree, risk-taking, to adventure, to stretching ourselves to the new rather than the old, inspired by Jesus, who we wait for. 
And while we're waiting, we serve and we love. Next slide. You remember that earlier last year, beginning of last year, I preached through a series of our aspirations as a church. And two of them, the G of great is being God-focused, and the T of great is, is for toiling to build the church well. I think the Thessalonians can teach us a lot about what it means to be God-focused and to toil to build the church well. And I encourage us to think for ourselves what it would mean for us to be more God-focused and to toil to build the church well. Next slide. We're going to have a time of prayer now. Anybody can pray. As Martin Luther said, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. <coughs> it's laying hold of his willingness. Let's pray for a bit. Anybody can pray. We'll take, uh, we'll take, take a few minutes to pray, and then we'll take the Lord's Supper together. So with these thoughts in mind, let's have a time of prayer.